So it started three or four years ago. I stopped in the Goodwill in Reno on my way to the playa, and I saw this Barbie pink prom dress. And I was, I want it so bad. I just wanted it so bad. I still have the dress. It is now spray painted, graffitied, and chopped up in crazy directions. And kind of ridiculous, but it's my favorite. And they wanted like 25 or $26 for it. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it. And then the guy was like, who was at the register, he's like, you should really get that dress. It was made for you. And I was like, yeah, I think so. My name is Barbie. And he's like, <laughs> I'm going to give it to you for the pound price. It's going to be like $2. And so I bought it, nice. and I went out, and I learned some very important things about ball gowns. A, when you're dressed fancy, people are nicer to you. B, if you don't like to be touched, wearing big clothing works really well because it's like this bear tactic. Like, you appear bigger than you are, and then people don't want to touch you. Well, you've got all that taffeta underneath it, and, like, people have to <laughs> lean in awkwardly to hug you. And also... It creates a formal interaction. Right. I, I am a very old school person in the way that I interact. I like wit, wit, I like quips, but I don't want some guy to come up to me and go, hey girl, what you doing tonight? Fuck that. No, I don't want that. I want people to treat me courteously. It doesn't even have to be like a lady. Holla back, mama. <laughs> you can get away with it. <laughs> 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 and the other thing is that you can put insane amounts of layers under a ball gown without anybody knowing and you still look good. So how many ball gowns do you bring with you on average? Last year I brought 20. (laughs) (laughs) That was Barbie telling us exactly why you never find her on Playa not wearing an evening gown. A ball gown, an evening gown. So what do we got going on today, Rex? Well, D-Day, today on Accuracy 3rd, we have our very first ever themed show. We're going to be hearing three stories from three different voices, all about first times at Burning Man. You're going to hear from Nathan, who you all heard from last episode. And if you haven't heard last episode, go listen to that right now. Then come back, listen to this. We'll also be hearing more from Barbie and from our friend Gummy Bear. Now, this thematic presentation is something we've always been aiming for. Uh, the more participation we get from you, the, the more we can do this. Yeah, so participate. Send us your stories. Tell us your ideas. Think of all the interesting things that have happened to you on Playa, and more importantly, tell them to us. You can share your stories on accuracythird.com. You can share them by recording them. You can share them by letting us interview you. You can just type something up and we'll read it. It doesn't matter. Get your voice on our podcast. And now, enjoy these three voices. Hi. So, the first year I went to Birdie Man, either 2010 or 2011, can't remember, I caught Mono on the way down. You noticed Mono on the way down. You Somebody dis- tossed you some Mono a week before, a couple days before? It's actually not confirmed it was Mono. It's just showed all the symptoms of being Mono. To this day, we don't actually know what it was, except that it was not strep throat. And I had 101 degree fever for eight days and 104 degree fever for two. Yeah, for anyone that doesn't know, that fever for too long just kills you. I traveled out from New York City and that was the most insane thing in the world. Basically, we got access to a next to free motorhome if we drove it out there. Um, Something you had to acquire in Reno? No, it was literally like in Connecticut somewhere. Oh, so you drove cross country in a motorhome? Yes. Like seven miles a gallon. Yeah. And our driver, are we allowed to swear on here? Oh, shit, yeah. This This is the the internet. Oh, okay. I don't know. Our driver was the biggest asshole that ever was. I first became aware of it, perhaps surprisingly, uh, because of a girl (laughs) that I was dating at the time uh, who had just started going, you know, the year before, the two years before that, I think. And... One of the documentaries about Burning Man was coming out. I don't actually remember what it was called. Uh, but I totally had that moment after watching it of feeling intensely homesick for a place I'd never been, which there was actually a Welsh word for. Hareith, which is the longing or homesickness for a place that you can never return to and perhaps might never exist. Oh, that's nice. So anyway, I had this this intense feeling. and I was, We had a small camp of friends that went, and we one of them bought a 1967 California Department of Corrections bus. Stripped out the inside, carpeted it, put up like some couches, bed in the back, little kitchenette, uh, strapped a bunch of shit to the top. 
got like two and a half miles a gallon and broke down five times on the way coming over from San Francisco. And it was amazing. When you got in the car on the way down to Burning Man, you were already feeling a little under the weather? Honestly, I can't actually tell you because we hadn't slept more than four hours in weeks. I mean, who knows? I could have been sick for a week and not known because it was crush mode. And um, we had also hit a deer on the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, just above Cedarville. That was exciting in the pitch black night. I barely remember it. I know that we didn't stop. We just kept going. But we did get to see the country. Oh my God, we got to go to like ghost towns and like um, also sleeping over, we would just break laws. Like we'd just park and sleep and didn't care. Like- sure, there's, there's a lot of empty space in the middle of this country where you can just kind of park and there's no one to care. They and shuffle you along, you just go. Off to the next county full of cornfields. The only thing that I have to say is like we started using our creative bathroom tactics before we even got to the playa. Yeah, I found again, out that the pee funnel stretches. did not work for me personally. Oh. <laughs> so did you try one of the Playa Tech pee funnels when you got to Playa? No. Have, I, you, have I, you seen them? No, that sounds terrifying. They're, uh, they're just a plastic Dixie cup with a little piece of... Uh, tubing. The tubing, tubing, yeah, uh, cocked into the bottom of it. You said cock. It's going to be this sort of recording session. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. Fair enough. So across the country, you came in an RV. Yes. And having we little s- mini adventures the whole way. Basically, I'm in the car with this gorgeous girl, and she and I have become friends. And asshole driver is just, he's been eyeing her forever. She does not want him to touch her with a tempo pole. So at night, it gets really hot in the motorhome because we don't have air conditioning. She took off a part of her clothing Uh and he was like, I'm going to jump into bed with her right now. So she starts like screaming, by the way, we're in Yellowstone National Park. Oh, Jesus. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) First of all, remember, I'm six feet. All right. My dreads out on playa make me six foot four. She's like flipping out. She has been assaulted. She goes and gets like the rangers in Yellowstone National Park. And she's like, I can't go one more night with this lunatic. And I'm like, great. Me neither. So I'm carrying like a 50 pound battery. Okay. In the RV. Uh-huh. Because I have sleep apnea and I uh, travel with camp mobility because we provide medical outlets for medical fridges, for uh, sleep apnea machines, for oxygen tanks, basically anyone with any type of anything that needs to be plugged in for a medical purpose is what we're all about and what we provide when we come to Playa. I was toting a 50 pound battery with its own suitcase. I was plugging my machine into that every night. So I have a Playa CPAP and I have a real life CPAP. That's smart. Yep. Never take anything out that you expect to come back. Yeah, absolutely. And also, like, I soak the bejesus out of that thing when it gets home. Like, I can't lift my bag down the stairs of the RV, you guys. So the rangers are like, we'll get it. Do you guys watch Criminal Minds? No. No. Oh, there's a guy in there who's like notorious for kicking down doors. These rangers shamar moored their way into our RV, grabbed my suitcase with, like, one arm. Like, grab her stuff. And they... Drive us out of Yellowstone to Cody, Wyoming, which is like two hours away, where we're put up in the Buffalo Bill Hotel. Oh, I've been to Cody very briefly. Yes. That's as much time as you can spend in Cody. My dad is on the phone with us. He was like, <laughs> get her to safety. You're you're bigger than she I'm bigger than everybody. We bonded, that's for sure. Like we had history instantly. You know, no, we didn't need a helicopter, but we had the next <laughs> best thing. Yeah, it's not good to stay around somebody who's not reading uh, yeah. those no signals in the way that yeah. people with who are healthy <laughs> would. Yeah, so you don't want to be with people who don't have a, a real firm grasp of consent. Um, the guy who's in charge of our camp got us two seats in a vehicle going to Playa, and that's all we needed. We jumped into a car with all of our stuff. Then we ran into the storm. So we get to Playa, and we went, and I got ushered into a truck, and then I went to um, Playa del Fuego, which is my old camp, and at that point, I was pretty sick. Oh, I, I got tricycled to the Death Guild one day because I have a bunch of friends there, and they have a surprisingly, or not surprisingly, large amount of doctors and nurses in that camp, mm-hmm. and so they were kind of doing some first aid it's not really that surprising that they have so many medical professionals there. 
about like all of the injuries that happened in Thunderdome. <laughs> like, why why wouldn't you bring doctors with you? We had a nurse camp with us one year, not because our installation was any sort of dangerous thing, but because when you're hungover, quite possibly the greatest thing to have happen when you wake up is have somebody stick you with some saline. Oh, and oh. a B12 shot. Oh, oh I it's want instant that. happy. It is, like. You don't have to drink your thirst away. It just, you get these waves of like, I don't want to say health running through you because <laughs> that that was waves of recovery. Ever, yeah, absolutely recovery. <laughs> I, I, you're not in a state of health out there, even if you haven't gone on a bender. By the time they figured out it wasn't strep, they had sent me to Reno. But that's this is four days later, for um. Because I'm allergic to most antibiotics, and the antibiotics I can take aren't carried on Playa. And I don't remember how we got the entry and exit passes. That's all a blur. But I do remember getting about halfway to Reno and then being informed by the driver who told me he was sober that he was not actually sober. Oh, no. And he was in an altered state. Was this a driver that you knew, or was this just some ride you caught? No, this was a friend of mine. Wow, that's somehow shittier. <laughs> um, Consent is important. The doctors in Reno were actually really cool and put me on hydrocodone cough syrup, which I was not expecting seeing as I came from Burning Man. And the drive back was really scary. I think at one point he was driving on the other side, the opposite side of the road. Oh, so he was fairly severely altered. Yeah, it didn't kick in really bad until we were coming back and then... With it being night and what he was altered on. The kind of thing that alters you and kicks in several hours later. Or climaxes in seven hours later. Those oh, of you who are man. familiar with the substances that are recreationally consumed at Burning Man can suss out for yourself what Sir might have taken. I'm, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> uh, don't do that at home, kids. That's dumb as shit. I'm really bad at going to parties. Uh, you know, if you... Hand me a free drink and say, "Go talk to some people." I'm just gonna be like, "Oh God, do I do I have to?" I still get the drink, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you put me behind a bar or give me a job to do, and I'm all set. Mm -hmm. That's why I became a bartender. Yeah, I think I made it like two days into my first Burning Man, and I was like, "I need something to do." And I knew a bunch of the folks from Cafe from the the previous life of having worked at the Ren Fair, and a lot of Cafe was started by people who got bored with Ren Fair. I met Graham, who you may know as Hippie Killer, mm -hmm. because I showed up to Barista, you know, for his like a 7 to 11 shift. I think he was doing 11 to 3, yeah, the graveyard shift. And like no one showed up for him. He had like one guy. Oh, that used to happen group. so often on those late night shifts. Oh, yeah. And so I just stayed and worked a double. I was like, well, fuck it. You need help. And they kept being like, you keep showing up on time and sober. Can we pay you? Do you want to be a manager? Do you mind keep doing your work and more work? We'll give you more work. Yeah. <laughs> so you started volunteering your very first year. I've, I've never not worked. Yeah, they just kind of handed me the, the grid in 2013, I think. That's insane. Now, yeah. was, uh, I don't want to call it electrical engineering, but uh, rough and tumble electrical engineering uh, <laughs> part of your skill set before you started volunteering with DPW? No, I learned it all on site. That's awesome. Burning yeah. Man is a wonderful place to fail. <laughs> it really is. True. You, you will learn like a solid third of a skill. Working at Burning Man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But often enough to get your foot in the door somewhere that you can actually start a job at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. where, you, where you couldn't have with zero experience. Yeah. Nobody and was going to let me manage like 165 people off Playa. <laughs> Just yeah. out of the... Like, oh, no, because yeah. I can. Just like, what do you mean you can? Just like, uh, I do plays, uh, work with <laughs> abused kids. Like, I can totally manage people. Yeah. yeah that, that only works at your Burning Man interview. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true. That's one of the things I love about it. So your parents go to Burning Man? My dad. I took him last year. How was that for you? He and Freddie Mercury have the same birthday in the same year. So they're exactly the same age if Freddie were still with us. I always felt like my dad would have a really great time at Burning Man. And the man burns on Freddie slash dad's birthday, um, September 5th. So I was like, it's like the biggest party ever. It's the greatest idea for anyone's birthday because like, look how many people go. <laughs> and anyway, so we got, uh, you know, he, he worked really hard last year with his friend and they got, they got themselves there last year and uh, their virgin burn was celebrated at 69 years old. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. How, how much did you facilitate their going? Did you just put the bug in his ear and he 
did it on his own. Okay, so what I would do is like I would make YouTube videos like look guys, it's really easy. And I'd like pack one bag Uh and I'd be like, look, we're almost done. You can do this too. And by the time I get home, and by the time I get home, we'll be packed and ready to go for burn to burning man. So just call and get in a U-Haul and I'll be on the next flight out to California. So I was just doing it to be like, Hey dad, Hey dad, Hey dad. And like it was, it, it worked. And what, what was his experience like? Did- a story that I think he'd really uh, like be okay with me telling. So we are camped right next to the Lovin' Oven. Okay. Okay, somebody had a really good idea. Mm-hmm. Flatbread, topless hot chicks. We literally shared a wall, a fictional <laughs> wall, with the Lovin' Oven. And our neighbor was a girl, and she was a moaner. <laughs> like, like she was, and let me tell you, you cross a line when you're in your tent, when your best friends is in the tent next to you, and your dad's in the third tent, and you're all hearing, ah, 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 <laughs> simultaneously forever. And it's like when it's done, you like take the zipper off your tent and you're like, is it free to come out yet? Because my dad and I just had the weird thing. <laughs> See, I, I think that <laughs> if they're going to put that into the community, the community should be accepting of it. And I, I like to shout things like, yeah, get it. <laughs> totally. That's when you, you pull up your camp chair, you crack a beer, you face their tent, and you just <laughs> enjoy the show. So like, guess what like my dad started doing? They were tailgating the boning. One. <laughs> <laughs> we were provided with all you can eat, plyo version of all you can eat. So that's like one bite a day mm-hmm. of <laughs> flatbread because we shared the wall. So we got flatbread all the time. So I didn't mind hearing sex noises if it meant I'd get pesto, onion, cheesy. He- oh. heavy like he- heavy melty gooey that's gummy fantastic. yeah that sounds great yeah you can have all the sex you want and be loud man can... the only food camp i ever camped next to was the gut hut <laughs> wow what was the... that sounds so is nasty. that like pork rinds all pork rinds oh god only pork i rinds? wish it was pork rinds it was <laughs> pork uterus shut up oh yeah it was a little chewy that it, it would really could have used some deep frying um and the pork brains were tasty but um could have used some uh Salt. S- no, they they could have used a pass through a sieve to get the stringy bits out. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> bleak. Yeah, gross. Yeah, no, they they would go to the Chinese grocer and pick the creepiest things that they could buy and bring them out to ply it. Oh my god, serve them. My second... <laughs> they were the the first camp to be shut down by the Nevada Health Department. <laughs> Thank God, buy oh, that. <laughs> I'm going to start bringing sulfa drugs in my first aid kit. That's smart. That's what yeah. I'm allergic to. That's what they have. They have sulfa. They have sulfa drugs? <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. They have, because I'm allergic to penicillin sulfa and sequor. The thing with being allergic to antibiotics, in most people's cases, it's from overuse. So for me, I had strep throat for a very long period of time when I was little. Right. And because I was in an age where they couldn't, they didn't want to take my tonsils out. They just kept switching the antibiotics. But my body was like, no, you motherfuckers just cut the tonsils out and kept developing these things from overuse of antibiotics. Right. Yeah. No, I'm just, I'm allergic to a lot of pharmaceutical things. Barbie, um, were you one of those kids that insisted on putting your mouth right on the <laughs> drinking fountain? I had the worst oral fixations when I was little. <laughs> I think my parents covered everything in syrup. If it can't give me a stop putting things in my mouth. Wow. Why do you go? Huh. We yeah. should be asking that to people more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I think the question is, why do you still go? Yeah, sure. What keeps you going? Uh, I mean, the first two years I went out were kind of rough. The relationship with the woman I was going out with was rocky. Um, it, it's a hard place for a mm-hmm. relationship. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it put you through paces. I was really not super thrilled about the event just because it all kind of flared together. It was all just a lump of feeling gross. And it was the temple. It was a temple in the way that I saw people interacting with it. The memory that sort of encapsulates the whole thing for me is when the Temple of Stars burned. I remember I was you know, probably right about 6 o'clock and showed up early, and um, we all just sort of sat down, sat around, and I didn't really know why we were there. I'm, I thought the temple was beautiful, but I didn't really know what to expect. The, was this your your first? Yeah, that was my year? Fir- that was my first year. So that was David Best's Temple of Stars. It was almost like a quarter mile long. It was ah, yeah. 
that, that, um, yeah, that was a beautiful example. Yeah, it was amazing. That was the year that uh, someone had these two Mylar kites on a wire and were basically flying the kites and they were, you know, aloft on the thermals from the, um, the burning temple and reflecting the light back down on the crowd. It was gorgeous. But the wind shifted. It had been really still. And the embers were just going straight up and then suddenly the wind shifted right about the time the first big rush of embers started coming down. And people were just getting shit falling on them, you know, literally raining fire from the sky. Uh-huh. And you could feel this animal tension building to panic and just emanating through the mob, a crowd on the verge of turning into a mob. And I feel like most of the places, that's just what would have happened. People would have gotten stampeded. People were just like, fuck it, every man for yourself. And uh, I watched people, you know, brushing embers out of strangers' hair and batting things out of the way. And deliberately calming each other down and I felt everything change and suddenly we were all just there and we were like okay this is what we're doing now and then it was fine and I I didn't think I'd ever see that anywhere else my first year the man was still on hay bales and they didn't really do a perimeter like they do now because there was like 14 rangers what year is this 99 Nice. So the crowd was pressed in much tighter mm, mm-hmm. than it, it is these days. And there was this project around the man called the Impotence Overcompensation Project, <laughs> which was just four giant kerosene jets that shot towers of flame 30 feet in the air. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. They were in the crowd. The perimeter was not back behind them. And the, they didn't have fence around it because it was back when Burning Man was real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they were going off. As we waited for the man to burn in the crowd, bits of not quite burned kerosene were dripping down on us. And every time they went off, there was this big radiant wave of heat. And we were standing, pressed chest to back, and we'd all lean together (laughs) away from the heat. Oh, Burning Man. That was pretty animal panicky. Yeah. And an unrepeatable, like, human moment. So you spent your entire first Burning Man sick and and suffering with that as your first experience what made you come back yeah i left the camp one other time it's friday at that point i had been in my tent for like seven days and i was about to lose my shit and i remember walking out onto the playa and it was the middle of a white white out and just feeling like the desert was washing me clean and to go back so before Burning Man, not only had I physically pushed myself as far as I could, I had also made a decision um, about a month and a half, two months before that, to let go of my pain. And because I used to identify with these strengths that I had acquired through going through struggle. Like, I am strong because I did this and I conquered that. But in doing so, I was still holding on to all this pain. So I made this decision to stop identifying with these things and instead to identify with positive aspects of myself, say I'm creative and I'm intelligent and I process quickly. But when I got mono, I felt like I was spiritually letting go of like 23 years of anguish. And so I'm walking out onto the desert, I'm walking to the temple and I haven't left camp and I've been fever delirious for days. like sober seeing shit and I feel this sand just washing over me it's like probably to this day one of the worst whiteouts I've ever seen you couldn't see more than a foot in front of you and and just feeling like it's cleaning my soul and then I made it to uh, Crystal Method for maybe like 45 minutes and I, I just sat I just sat and soaked up the music so rather than identifying with it making your pain the the core of who you were you were finally processing through it yep exactly and is that is that what brought you back to burning man was it that relieving yourself of that burden i mean i'm a glutton for punishment (laughs) (laughs) and so it's like with burning man like yeah i came and it totally kicked my ass it won it totally won i didn't like die but i got close but I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stop at that point. I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna volunteer because that's what you do. You get up, you pick your shit up, and you fucking kill it. When you stumble, don't be afraid to break down.
down You know sometimes you gotta break down by the side of the road Break down and love light from the gutter Break down and watching the stars grow whoa, break down You know sometimes you gotta break down and sing out loud Break down and love light from the gutter Break down before the lights go Fuck your transformation. <laughs> and to be clear, I never said that Bernie Man was transformative. I said that I was transforming during Bernie Man. Now, can we get you to say that Burning Man was transformative? <laughs> no. I just got into a car accident that was life-changing. Illnesses and injuries, no matter where they take place, if they are impactual, they're going to be impactual. And the setting is just part of the facilitation of the process. So really what we're getting at here is the fact that it is impossible to go to Burning Man without sustaining some degree of injury that makes Burning Man inherently transformative. At the very <laughs> least, your cuticles are going to split. <laughs> right? Like you're gonna, oh, yeah. You're going to twist your ankle. Your hands um, show it for weeks. <laughs> you really want me to say it? Yeah. <laughs> you really, you're really fishing for me to say Burning Man was transformative. Huh? Hey, did you just hear that Barbie said the Burning Man was transformative for? Can you edit that out, Beth? <laughs> <laughs> the years they sit heavy, the minutes ride fast. You could cut through this night like a knife. Gray hours of November are hard to remember when weather is the measure of life. Two stars in the night. The music on this podcast has been by Vagabondage. You can find information on them and all of the other artists that have contributed music to our podcast on the podcast music section of our website, accuracythird.com. Next episode. We'll be sharing a singular conversation with you again. But if you like the thematic work that we did on this episode, we're going to need a lot more stories from you so we can shuffle them out, you know, get them sorted by theme, edit them down into a decent episode, and send them your way. So please, go to the submission section of our site and send us your story. Accuracy Third is edited by Drunk Beth. Our theme music is by Jim and Damien. We're distributed under the Creative Commons license. Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third, which is D-Day, Rex, and Drat. Thanks for listening. The greatest love that you found was back home When hearts are confused by desire stars in the night And we're down for bottles of wine There's two stars in the night And we're down for bottles of wine There's two stars in the night And we're down for bottles of wine there's two stars in the night And we're down for bottles of wine <laughs>